Among the starving of Ethiopia, Australian flower power is fighting a cruel regime as well as famine. Only under cover of trees or darkness is it safe to dole out our life-giving food relief. And the need has never been greater. Thanks for joining me. Five years ago, the world rallied generously to the hungry of Ethiopia. A global rock concert, the biggest gig of all time, focused the energies of countless millions on their plight. But the band aid solution was only temporary. Northern Ethiopia is once again in the grip of famine. And the central government's shameful use of starvation as a weapon of war, so tellingly documented by Four Corners reporter Chris Masters back in 1985, is again seriously compromising efforts to help. The Marxist regime in Addis Ababa has exploited the Horn of Africa's strategic position on the Red Sea to win major arms and technical support from the Soviet Union. But in the Gorbachev era, Moscow is pulling out and rebels in the northern Ethiopian province of Tigray are seizing their moment to push demands for independence. Tragically, the starving civilians of Tigray are again caught in the political crossfire. Mark Colvin reports from Tigray on the double jeopardy of war and famine. In northern Ethiopia, history is a living thing. Sixteen centuries ago, when Europe was descending into the Dark Ages, Christianity came here. Today, the great cathedral at Aksum in central Tigray continues almost untouched, a tradition that dates back to the fall of the Roman Empire. In Aksum's history, Christianity itself is a relative newcomer. Hundreds of years before Christ, there was civilization here. Some even claim that it was from Aksum that the Queen of Sheba in the Bible story traveled to the court of King Solomon. In recent centuries, this branch of the Coptic Church has dominated all the kingdoms and empires that ruled Ethiopia. Defeating the imperial ambitions of Byzantium, Portugal and Italy, they repelled successive invasions and occupations. The ancient isolation was maintained. Now, in the television age, these are the people we know only as victims. Tigray have become victims, it's not only drought and famine that have made them so, it's war. This was Mekele, the regional capital of Tigray, under bombardment from the Ethiopian Air Force only last year. 
By any standards, a town like this is a civilian target. But this is a civil war. The bombs are dropping on orders from the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Orders from a regime whose chief slogan now is everything for the war front. And that war is being fought against the people of northern Ethiopia itself. And in the Tigrayan capital, Makele, even when the bombing stops, the suffering continues. <coughs> From experience of recent weeks, I know that most of the mothers bring their babies, they tell us they've got diarrhea. But when we start quizzing them, some have genuine diarrhea, but many are looking for food. Uh -huh. So it's malnutrition. I'd say malnutrition. And diseases. At the Catholic-run clinic just outside town, Sister Margaret Coyne is seeing at least 250 new patients every week. Some are not malnourished, but they too suffer needlessly. War means more poverty, more isolation, fewer doctors and nurses, and less medicine. Tuberculosis of the spine and the glands is rife. The treatment for TB involves a course of 60 injections, but the world seems to have forgotten the McKelly Clinic. Medical supplies here are almost exhausted. We all have had a lot of TB. But in recent months, it seems to be much worse. And have you got enough medicines to treat it? Unfortunately, no. We had a good supply last year, but we're nearly at the end. Well, he's malnourished. He's a year and three months old. So he's really um, very much underweight. And once again, the skeleton of hunger is on the march. These are not the pictures you remember from 1984 or 85. This is 1990. The quiet famine has begun. You were here in 1984, 85. Yes. How is this comparing with that famine? Do you have any doubts that this time it is just as bad? It's just as bad. I'd say it's even worse because it's more difficult to get relief in. And you don't see the same pathetic groups on it, but the air all around the countryside, we know we live here, that everybody nearly is hungry. Even in the town of Mechle, there are thousands with nothing. To They've no income, nothing. This is, is probably the most disturbing famine because, because it's a, a quiet famine. Um, I was here in, in 84, 85 at a refugee camp and it was very dramatic then where you have thousands of people and people poured out across the border and so on. And so the world knew that, you know, people were starving and people were dying. The same situation exists today. But people have been uh, asked to stay in their own homes so that they wouldn't have the, the massive dislocation, the disruption to personal lives and to the whole programs that are, that are happening within, within Tigray. And they have done this uh, with the faith that the international community would respond. But that response has been too little and too late. Getting food to Tigray is difficult and dangerous. The Mengistu government even wages war on aid to the north. The convoys dare not move while the Ethiopian Air Force's Russian-supplied MiGs are still in the sky. They won't even set out till the hour before sunset. The only way in is the clandestine one, across the Sudanese border. To reach central Tigray and deliver the food means several hundred kilometers traveling some of the world's worst roads. The trucks may cover only 60 kilometers in an entire night. Then they have to find cover from the air. All the 
roads are bad, some are appalling. The trucks are old and the conditions age them faster. Convoys are meant to stay together, but mechanical breakdowns mean they often spread out. Loan trucks are vulnerable to attack by bandits or guerrillas paid by the Ethiopian government. It's no way to run a relief operation, but the war means there is simply no choice. To call trucks like this second hand hardly begins to describe the condition they're in. They'd already done a full lifetime's work in Europe before being sold to Africa, and it shows. This is the beginning of our fourth full night on the road since leaving the Sudan. In that time, we've covered less than 300 kilometers. There are constant mechanical breakdowns. Tire changes like this one happen 20, 30, even 40 times during a single trip. This really ought to be a strong lifeline for the needy. As it is, it's more like a fragile thread. Soon the thread will be more fragile still. The wet season, from May onwards, turns the dust into quagmire. The convoy's speed will drop from slow to agonizing. Even less food will get through. Getting supplies into the country is only the beginning of the problem. To feed the hungry, you have to reach people in their villages. But the roads into the rural areas are even worse. This is Wumberta province in eastern Tigray. Convoys are out of the question. <laughs> Two and a half million people are affected by this famine. Most live in areas remote from even the most basic facilities. Food will not come to them. They have to walk to get food. For tens of thousands of Tigrayans, that means a day's march each way, every month, or even every fortnight. Many have even further to walk up to five days in some cases, with the prospect of 50 kilos of grain to carry home at the end of it. <laughs> Food cannot even be handed out in daytime. People waiting for grain have been bombed and machine gunned from the air. They can't afford to take that chance again. This is Wukro, the town the people of Wumberta have to get to if they want food. To get here may be hard, but in 1984 and 85, the walk to refugee camps in the Sudan was harder. The tens of thousands who died in those camps or on the way have a kind of memorial here. The Relief Society of Tigray distributes the food and it's fanatical about ensuring it goes to the neediest people.
Only fairness and equity in the distribution can continue to persuade people not to migrate in search of bread. If they return with the food to their villages, their societies have a chance of rebuilding when the famine ends. If not, epidemics and mass starvation face them in foreign camps. But the question is, fair shares of what? All this effort is based on the Relief Society's assumption, when the drought began, that the world outside would send food. We had an assessment uh, at that time, international uh, assessment, that uh, uh, many governments, uh, NGOs, and uh, even the international community was uh, ready to give much help. So we were confident enough, and based on that confidence, we told our people to stay in their village. And was your confidence rightly placed? Well, uh, things didn't go, uh, or we didn't meet what we expect. Teklaweni Asefa runs the Relief Society of Tigray's distribution work almost single-handed. Time and again, he states his faith in the international community. But his faith is being sorely tried. If you take the tracking uh, of food of February, we have the capacity of transporting 12,000 metric ton. And uh, we only transported 5,000 metric ton which is about 40% of our capacity and 60% were deficit. Now nobody is uh, helping and no food is coming. They have to stay at home and die there. You feel forgotten by the international community? I am, yes, yes, but I'm sorry to say it, but uh, I feel it really for uh, have for one year, this famine is going on, and the help is very, very, very little. The people of Tigray have a right to feel cheated by the world's indifference. It's not as if they're just sitting there waiting for handouts. For the last five years, with education and development, Tigrayans have been trying to rebuild their society. Drought and war, not bad intentions, have brought the famine back. Forced by the fear of daytime bombing to teach their children under cover of darkness, they've tried to follow the textbook model for averting famine. Somehow, for the next generation, they have to ensure that crops won't go on failing. There has to be a way to beat the cycle of drought and starvation. The focus in this harsh, dry land is on conserving Tigray's soil and water. Irrigation. What is the meaning of irrigation? Irrigation means supply with water by a means of water cannon. Water cannon means a cannon which we use to pass or to irrigate water from lake or a river. In theory and in practice, you see it at every level. This is Dera, a village in one of Tigray's worst affected areas. There's been no rain, the harvest has failed. Dera stopped being able to feed itself months ago. Yet morning after morning, people whose own fields lie barren for lack of rain turn out to help terrace the land. 
The hope is to halt the ruinous erosion which strips away the topsoil in the rainy season. But many working now are aware that they may not themselves be alive when the next harvest comes. This work will benefit only the survivors of the quiet famine. Already, 90% of the people of Dera are too weak to work. Even these people, the fortunate 10%, seemed to tire and weaken after only an hour or two. In Dera, desperation is setting in. This boy's name is Mahari Girme. He's 12 years old. Mahari has just become a shepherd. His family, with nowhere left to turn, hired him out to a local merchant. At the end of a month, if he can last that long, Mahari will take home his pay, five kilograms of barley. <laughs> Mahari's family are proud people, with no desire to beg or to make slaves of their children. They have no choices left. in December, when his harvest of barley and peas had produced nothing in the drought, Germe Seneslet sold his cow and calf. Two months later, the proceeds of that sale were gone. He sold his ox, the ox he would need to plough for the next harvest. By then, though, everyone was selling and the price was low. Enough for this blanket, for warmth, and a little grain and flour. <laughs> Their son, Adzibha, was not so philosophical. Around the turn of the year, he trekked more than 100 kilometers north into territory held by the Ethiopian government, the Derg. He'd heard there was a food distribution center at a place called Senafa. We know that uh, a few weeks ago in January, people had come from uh, Tigray to go to a, dis a food, food distribution site at a place called Senafa. And what we do know that 
over 700 people, young, young boys and men, were rounded up and taken away in trucks. So they'd gone to get food yes. and they got conscripted into the Ethiopian army? Well, they were taken away in trucks and one can only assume that, um, you know, that that was a possibility that could have happened. And this now, was seen by people you trust? This was confirmed by three sources, including the Catholic clergy at Adagrat, and they in fact told, told us about this. Their son gone, the family lost a daughter too. She died of hunger two weeks before our visit. There are so many mouths left to feed. This was the only meal of the day. Broad beans soaked in water overnight and toasted on the fire. <laughs> There couldn't have been more than 50 beans to feed the seven of them. Still, when the neighbor's children came in, they were fed too. The mother, Abrahet, was almost too weak to talk. All were in pain, with headaches and aching joints and listlessness. This was last month. We can only guess how many of the family are still alive. Hearing we were there, the village council called the parents of sick and malnourished children to bring them for our cameras. The famine was out from behind closed doors. Malnourished children don't always cry much or scream. They haven't the energy. Some show the pain, though. This boy was two and a half. His name was Gebre. Profoundly malnourished then, and in constant discomfort, Gebre is almost certainly dead by now. He had diarrhea, a mass killer in the third world, which the World Health Organization says could be alleviated simply by giving the children a solution of salt, water and sugar. When I asked the boy's father, Gide, if he knew this, Gide said, yes, but where would we get salt and sugar? For the people of Dera, it's rare to see a car. Aeroplanes to them mean only machines for killing from the air. Silence here is broken by the coughs of the sick and dying. In this village, the politics of the war are profoundly remote. Hunger is now the only reality. Thank you.
Politics, however, cannot be disentangled from the famine or the war. This concert in Adwa, central Tigray, was also a recruitment drive for the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. It's the TPLF that's led Tigray's fight against Ethiopia's Mengistu regime. <laughs> They say Marxist-Leninist rule from Addis Ababa has brought discrimination, deprivation, brutality and hunger to the people of the north. Yet the TPLF too is dominated by Marxism. We were told 60% of the Front's Central Committee come from the Marxist-Leninist League of Tigray. Having brought us to this concert, our hosts prevented us from filming till they'd covered over the Marxist-Leninist League's flag painted on the back of the stage. The hastily erected red curtain was there only to conceal a giant symbol of a hammer, a sickle and a Kalashnikov automatic rifle. That symbolism apparently was too potent for the outside world to see. Even aid groups and charities sympathetic to the TPLF suggest that its ideological base is a type of Stalinist Marxism. Yet the TPLF's popularity with ordinary people is undeniable and clear to anyone who travels into Tigray. The front has done the groundwork. It has deep roots in the community. And equally important, the TPLF is winning the war. This was the road to the key Ethiopian town of Debra Tabor only weeks ago. An ITN crew with the besieging forces only 10 kilometers out recorded this MiG raid on the road. sheltering in a culvert below, died in the MiG attack. This is Deborah Tabor now. We were the first journalists to film the town in TPLF hands. This terrain had been a battlefield for months. Now, few outward signs of the conflict remain. The TPLF seized Deborah Tabor briefly once before. This time, it looks as if they're here to stay. This was the command post for the Ethiopian army garrison that held the town of Deborah Tabor. And over there in the far distance is Lake Tana, the source of the Blue Nile. But this is more than just one more territorial gain because also in the distance there is Bayodar, and that's the site of one of the Ethiopian government's most important airfields. Rebel artillery has taken out that airfield, and the result is that in the last three weeks, Deborah Tabor has seen no MiG activity. The capture of Deborah Tabor gave the TPLF an extra strategic advantage. It cut Addis Ababa off from the province of Gonda, a massive gain to the rebels. For some time, the TPLF has controlled the whole of Tigray. 
Now they also have large parts of the provinces to their west and south. And every month the push continues. The Addis Ababa government is further weakened by the need to fight on two fronts. In February, the TPLF's northern allies in Eritrea, the EPLF, took the seaport of Massawa. That cut off the Ethiopian government's main supply line to the northern army, which is now under siege in the Eritrean capital, Asmara. Outside Deborah Tabor, stark evidence of the panic caused by Masawa's fall. The Ethiopian army lost its nerve in retreat. All equipment was destroyed rather than let it fall into rebel hands. From the captured diary of the Ethiopian Brigadier General commanding Deborah Tabor, on the day Masawa fell. Now the seaway is lost, we can't supply the second army by air. It is impossible. Therefore, resort to defense. Make gallant resistance and heroic defense. So the case is sealed. No more attack. And the next day, the 15th Division is going. We resort to defense. In the towns already under TPLF control, those who have not joined the rebel army have little to do but wait. There's almost no economic activity and unless the military push results in decisive victory, there won't be. There's no malnutrition in the towns yet, but people can't live forever on slogans. The pictures of Marx and Lenin date from the time the Ethiopian government controlled this town, but the TPLF conspicuously haven't painted them over. There's a fear that if they win the war, they'll simply replace one dictatorship in Addis Ababa with another. Uh, if the people accept the Marxist-Leninist parties, then that, that will rule. If it's, it's upon the choice of the uh, people, so for always the guarantee is the people. How strong is the Marxist-Leninist influence in the TPLF, though? I've been told that it's as much as 60% on the Central Committee. Well, uh, we cannot put it uh, uh, number-wise, 60 or 50%. Why not? Why not? Well, that's impossible. It's, it, it depends upon... But surely it must it, be it, possible it, to count the number of people on the Central Committee who well, are Marxist-Leninists. Well, I cannot count. I, I can count the num members of the TPLF. I cannot count the members of the MLLT. Well, perhaps you can give me an estimate of the strength of the Marxist-Leninist influence on the TPLF. Oh, well, I can't give you this. Uh, just that organization itself has to answer that. But I can say. The TPLF may be evasive about politics, but those who've seen them in action say their practical work is admirably straightforward. We shouldn't lay the mortar in the water. Shane Dolan and Peter Morrison are Australian aid workers in the central Tigray hamlet of Idaga Abi. They're teaching TPLF people to dig wells. The same as well number two. Okay. Not as simple as it sounds in a country where drilling rigs are about as common as space rockets. <laughs> Dolan and Morrison say the TPLF's emphasis is on appropriate technology. Donkeys instead of trucks, local stonemasons instead of concrete.
And they say that's all of a piece with the TPLF's work in the villages, which emphasizes democracy from the grassroots up. Of course, we don't see the battle or anything like that. All we can see is the development side of the TPLF, which for, for me and I know for Peter, we feel very positive about. We can see that they are working with the people, they're giving the people the power to govern themselves, to uh, ele elect their own people to govern themselves. They've got the water program that we're involved in, they've got agricultural programs, they've got the clinics, they've got schools. I've never ever seen any any bullying or, or bossing. They really are one with the people, and uh, I think that's a, a great comment about their authenticity as work as working for the people. Only a hundred metres from the well project, people were queuing for food. <laughs> In future droughts, wells may help tide the community over the dry times. For now, though, people have no choice. It's a short-term crisis, and no amount of long-term planning will help. They need the food only the outside world can give. Adaga Abi is in central Tigray. The worst of the famine hasn't hit here yet. Yet these people were already dependent on the grain coming through. They're living from fortnight to fortnight with no guarantee that next time the food will be here. The people at the moment are getting food, but like I say, if a truck doesn't come within uh, 15 days, there's no food. And from that time, from having no food at all, deterioration happens fairly rapidly. And of course, if, if the people have to walk to uh, transit camps and refugee camps, their condition will deteriorate very quickly. It won't be a slow process, it'll happen very fast. By the time the last of the grain is doled out, people's desperation starts to show. Whatever the politics, these people depend on the food the world gives that only the TPLF and the Relief Society of Tigray can bring them. Theories about Marxism and Leninism don't make much impact on the children, the sick and the starving. After all, I believe that humanity should not be complicated with politics. A child, and a hungry child, doesn't know politics. You see? Then, I think the international community are aware of this. <laughs> Ten thousand prisoners of war marching north into Tigray. Only weeks ago, these men were serving in the Ethiopian army. Most were conscripts from the south and southwest of Ethiopia. They had little knowledge of the war they were signed up to fight, and now, in the hands of the TPLF, they showed few signs of regret that they'd lost. These were the prisoners taken when the Ethiopians lost the Battle of Debra Tabor. We saw them on the way to camps in Tigray's northwest, where they'll be held and, as the TPLF describes it, re-educated for a few months before being released. Scenes like this are a public humiliation for Africa's biggest standing army. The Ethiopian government must know the rebels are on a winning roll. <laughs> 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 
Under international pressure over its handling of the famine, the Mengistu regime has made one concession. For the first time, it's allowing church organizations to bring food through the southern battle lines to feed the starving in the north. We filmed one of the first convoys to use the newly opened road. For the first time, food trucks were traveling through rebel-held territory in broad daylight. The Ethiopian Air Force had guaranteed there would be no bombing. Outside Ethiopia, the media were hailing it as a breakthrough. But when we caught up with the convoy, we found it stopped far short of the famine zone. They were unloading at Kobo, a relatively prosperous town, still hundreds of kilometers short of the areas where people actually needed the food. These long-awaited daytime convoys are a small sign of hope, but for the moment, that's all they are. For one thing, the quantities involved are not large. For another, they're not getting the food through to the north where the people most desperately need it. But even if that happens, these convoys of themselves are not going to be enough. They'll supplement, rather than replace, the existing clandestine cross-border operation. In the north and east and in isolated villages, people need more than gestures. For some, it's already too late. Just a day after our interview, we returned to see the Seneslet family. The mother, Abrehet, was dying. What? <laughs> Mark Colvin reporting. For all the dangers and difficulties he showed of getting aid into Tigray, Australia has a better record than most. Melbourne alone has given more than $900,000 to the Age newspaper's Food for Life appeal. The response hasn't been quite so great in other cities, but Community Aid Abroad and Freedom from Hunger are sponsoring appeals to alleviate the famine in both Tigray and the neighbouring province of Eritrea. The telephone numbers on your screen will put you in touch with either or both appeals. That's all from Four Corners tonight. Next Monday we visit Japan for a very different perspective on the controversial MFP, the multifunction polis. See you then. Good night.